several years, George Bush making three tax cuts in a row, and uh, Obama actually putting in some further tax cuts and not raising rates. It's not just about tax, taxes. One of the things that Ronald Reagan did when he came in is he addressed taxes, but he also went after regulation. He had the Grace Commission go out and try to <coughs> tackle regulations. I talk to small business owners all the time. Any small business owners here today? Go ahead, don't be shy. Yep. Um, do you have any idea if you were to hire a worker, how much that worker will cost you a year or two from now with the regulations coming out of Washington? So as a business, how long have you been in business? 15 years, so relatively successful. So you make smart decisions. You assess the risk and then manage your risk to make sure your company continues to prosper. And if you have no idea how much your employees are going to cost you, you can't make a good decision on whether to hire somebody or not, whether it's going to make money for your business or going to lose money. And with all these regulations coming out of Washington, it's hitting everywhere, everywhere. So let me give you a couple examples of what we need to do to get rid of regulations that are killing jobs. One, the American Disabilities Act. I think it's a wonderful regulation that allows our disabled Americans better access to normal life and society. However, the problem is, is that regulation allows for the personal injury lawsuit to come along that if your business is not compliant with ADA, somebody can sue you and uh, get a lawyer and try to get money out of you instead of complaining to the government, and the government says, hey, you need a ramp, or you need a wider aisle, or whatever. And now, instead of making this regulation between the government and the business, it's between the individual and the business. And I have, again, talked to several business owners that have suffered from these type of lawsuits. One uh, restaurant owner who was going to start a second restaurant in Martinez, 30 employees, but he was hit with two lawsuits. One was an ADA lawsuit, and the second was a unlawful termination lawsuit, which goes into my third category of too much litigation. And on the unlawful termination, just to go over that way for a second, uh, the fellow was stealing out of the till. So the owner fired him. Imagine that. What a horrible guy, right? <laughs> well, this, the, the, the criminal, I'll call him, comes back and sues for unlawful termination. Well, the restaurant owner, goes to his lawyer, and the lawyer says, oh yeah, you're gonna win, no problem, but it's gonna cost you fifty to $75,000 to go through this lawsuit, so why don't we offer him 25 grand to walk away? Well, as a smart businessman, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go with the, cut your losses, right? Well, then he also got hit with one of those uh, lawsuits about the ADA, which cost him another several thousand dollars, so between those two things, he lost all his capital that he would have had to invest in his second restaurant and 30, jobs lost. And nothing was accomplished in terms of compliance with ADA or the, the fact that that fella uh, you know, wrongfully sued. So another thing I'd like to see on the litigation side is loser pays. Loser pays. You're going to have to have some skin in the game if you want to sue me. Uh, and yes, of course, we have to be careful because there's the big guy who will squish the little guy and uh, drown him in, in bills. We have to have some sort of protections in there for that, but if you're going to come after somebody with a frivolous lawsuit and you lose, then you're going to lose. And if we do that, I think we actually get, we actually stop some of these frivolous lawsuits. Let me give you another one, just to, just to rally up, just to get you going. There's a car dealership in my town, back in there, and they used to put on a wonderful carnival every year. Rides and games, and they shut down the street, and close his business for a day. And it was a community event that everybody enjoyed. Well, a couple was coming off the Ferris wheel, and the gal tripped and fell, and skinned her knees, or whatever happened to her. Um, and she was like, gonna just brush it off and walk away. But the, the husband goes, oh no, 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 this is a car dealership. Walks up to the owner, who I talked to, this is the owner's story I got from him directly. The guy walks into his office and says, hey, my wife fell off your Ferris wheel. I want one of the cars off the lot. <laughs> so the owner says, no, I don't play that game. And the, the wife's trying to say, no, no, I'm OK. Don't worry. You know, but the husband wanted to press the case. So after a year of litigation and all the rigmarole and money that the owner had to pay, it ends up you know, settling for some minuscule amount because it 
I mean, the owner was mad, and he stuck to his guns for a long time. But he finally wrote him a check for like 7500 bucks to make him go away. When he was willing to write him about a $25,000 check, and the guy wanted more. You know? But guess what happened? So that all was a cost to the owner, and we no longer have that carnival in back of it, because he shut it down, right? Because he's afraid of being sued. So we got to have something to where these frivolous lawsuits with these unscrupulous lawyers that just want to throw spaghetti against the wall and see if it sticks, there is a, a penalty for that and it'll stop. So a couple of things there for you. Now I'm going to talk about another regulation that I want you to understand how I think. The EPA is an organization that is simply out of control. Some bureaucrats writing regulations trying to create this safe world for us without any real consideration for the consequences down line on our economy, on your business, on jobs, on real life down here as they try to create this perfectly safe world. I talked to an Exxon engineer who says the EPA is regulating how much heavy metal that Chevron can have in their wastewater that goes into open water sources. Great idea. That's a good thing. I don't want a bunch of mercury and lead in our open water and eat those fish later on down the line. That's a good uh, exercise of government authority. The problem is the EPA comes in and tells that engineer exactly how he's going to remove that metal from the water very inefficiently and very expensively. The engineer says to me, please, leave me alone. Just give me the limit. I'll figure out how to do it much better, much cheaper, and uh, you know, better than that, what the EPA will ever tell me to do. So let's get government out of running businesses telling them what to do, give them some limits. You know, you have to have clean air, you have to have clean water, you have to have a safe work environment. Nobody's arguing with that. But actually telling businesses how to do it is where the government has got too much control and going wrong and costing jobs. So we need to go through these regulations that have been coming down out of Washington, D.C., and we need to cost-benefit analysis them. We need to make some sense out of them. This is the 21st century. We have a lot more data. We have a lot more information that we can make good regulations that don't cost unnecessarily jobs in the economy. But you need people that are willing to go in and fight and work and try to make it happen, and I'm one of them. Okay, so that's number one, growing jobs. We're going to solve that stuff. Okay, cut spending. Let's get into that. We have about a $3.6 trillion budget in uh, our federal government. $3.6 trillion. Now to put that in context, we have approximately a $15 trillion economy every year. So, you know, it's smaller, but it's way too much. And we spend a lot of money on things we shouldn't spend money on. And if it's, uh, whether it's a $3 million study your tax dollars that went to UC Irvine to study kids playing video games. No kidding. Really? Somebody in your government signed off on that and spent $3 million of your dollars to do that. But when you're talking about a trillion dollar deficit, that's like 0.3%. That's nothing. Big deal. 0.03%. It's so small. Who cares? $3 million. Bucks. Okay. How about the VA, Veterans Administration? I'm a vet. I'm still actively serving as a reservist. Well, you're... VA spent $175 million on buildings they don't use, including an, eight, an octagon monkey house in Dayton, Ohio. Why are we wasting your tax dollars on that? $175 million, that's a lot of money. But still, with a trillion dollar deficit, what's $175 million, right? Okay, the government overall, and these numbers come from the Heritage Foundation, wastes $20 billion a year on buildings they don't use. $20 billion of your tax dollars are going out the window. That's a lot of money. Now let's up it a little bit more, and let's talk about uh, Medicare. Something that I have a 99-year-old grandma who uses Medicare, Social Security. I think we have to save these programs. We have to change them to some degree for people my age and people uh, my son's age. But they have to be there, they have to be safe, we have to be able to afford them. But right now we're wasting about $100 billion in fraud and waste in Medicare. 
all, a little over a fifth of the budget. If we could save that money without ever cutting one service to our seniors, cutting one payment to a doctor, save that money, Medicare all of a sudden becomes a whole lot more affordable. And it's not this huge crisis that we're in about not being able to, to afford it down the line. So those are some real spending cuts. Now I'll go into some other things. Let's talk about farm subsidies for a second. I'm looking at probably everybody close to middle class in here or lower. I don't know if anybody's in upper class. God bless you. Uh, we have envelopes in the back. We'll be talking about that later. <laughs> but your middle class dollars, tax dollars, you go to work, you pay your taxes, and money that is in your wallet that the government is coming in and grabbing out of your wallet. Hey, there's my baby girl, Holly, and my wife, Christy. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hey. Holly just did her SAT. Yeah. Ooh. I think she just aced her SAT. <laughs> I can't believe my favorite girl is 18 years old. I still have a 14 year old, so that's good. You can't have another birthday ever. It <laughs> looks 16 right there. And my wife, she's 29 and holding. I have a good answer. That's why you're happily married, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks married 23 time. years this month. Very good. 29 and holding, though. That's right. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so back to this idea of the government coming into your middle class wallet or purse, taking money out, taking it through the government bureaucracy, lots of money being lost along the way, and money from your pocket is ending up in the pockets of people like Rockefeller, Ted Turner, and Scottie Pippen, if anybody's a basketball fan, yes, Scottie Pippen and the Chicago Bulls, through farm subsidies. Why in the world is your money ending up in their pockets through something called a farm subsidy? That's wrong, and that's got to be fixed. That's a terrible waste of your dollars, a terrible uh, waste of government spending and authority. It's got to be fixed. But you have to have people in Congress willing to go after that stuff, plant their flag in the sand and say, no, enough, we can't afford this stuff. Oh, oh they'll, the people will say, oh, you're doing bad things, you're cutting this, look at the poor children, they'll have you know, babies and puppies crying on the TV. <laughs> and look what you're doing, the horribleness. But the real tragedy is the status quo, because the status quo is unsustainable. The real tragedy is if we keep doing what we're doing, yes, babies and puppies will be crying, for real. And we have to make changes today to make sure those babies and puppies have food and water and all the stuff they need. Okay? So to do that, we're going to have to cut a lot of spending. And those are just some ideas. Let me give you another one, because I could go on forever. But let me give you another one. Spotted owl. Familiar? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Spotted owl? It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Anybody, I had a, uh, a gentleman who lost his job thanks to the Spotted Owl in, uh, 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 a couple of town halls ago. Anybody in that category? Anybody in the lumber industry? Okay, so I'm not going to argue or debate the, t the Spotted Owl issue, but I'm going to tell you that there was a program put in place to help the lumber industry back then, the late uh, 80s, early 90s, to transition out of that as a compensation for losing their ability to make money because of the Spotted Owl. It was targeted at Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. That's right. Okay, maybe a good idea. Like I said, I'm here to argue that. I don't want to say that if it's good or bad. I want to talk about it. What I want to talk about is the last 20 years, that program has grown by millions and millions of dollars. And there are 43 states tapping into that program, taking your tax dollars for their lumber industry that they lost because of the spotted owl. This is the growth of government bureaucracy that is out of control. That we have to elect some people to say, nonsense, not going to vote for that, not going to let that happen anymore. Cut the spending. On the, on the budget, I hope, and I'm going to tell you this, I hope Paul Ryan is our VP choice. And the reason I hope he's the VP choice, other than the, the obvious reasons, is because I don't want to talk about the Paul Ryan budget anymore. I want to talk about the Rick Tubb budget. And the Rick Tubbs, the Tubbs budget is going to balance our federal budget in five years. It's going to cut gross spending from 3.6 million. We'll cut it 3.5% every year and we'll get the $3 trillion. Now, our revenue, about 2.5 trillion, in a growing economy, 3 
percent, you know, going back 150 years or something like that is an average. We've been low, and our government has uh, made it more difficult for our economy to grow. You know, economies expand and they contract. And we should be in a very fast expansion right now after that huge contraction that we suffered in the 2000s. Well, because of all the regulation and all the things coming out of Washington, our expansion has been depressed. So I'm assuming once we do some of these smart things to release the job creators in this country, we'll have a 4%, and that's really conservative, I expect it to be more, but a 4% growth rate will take 2.5 trillion in revenue up to three. And in five years, we have a balanced budget. And now we keep doing that, and in 30 years, with the surpluses that'll come in, and this is a lot of math, so I won't bore you. But my goal is to balance in five, pay off that 20 trillion, because it'll get to 20 trillion before we turn this around. Pay that 20 trillion dollars off in debt in 30 years. It'll be like a house mortgage. Just happen to work out that way. <laughs> so anyway, so that that's my goal. That's that's the first thing right there. Balancing the budget. I spent a lot of time on that. I'll answer more questions on it. But I really want you to get a hold of the idea that Rick Tubbs. Hopefully your next congressman is going to work on that as my number one issue. Number two, Obamacare. I'm going to give you some clear choices here. If you like Obamacare, vote for John Gearman. If you like that originally it was supposed to cost $940 billion over 10 years, one year later the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, has now estimated a double to $1.72 trillion in 10 years. If you like that, vote for John Garamendi. If you like the increase in your insurance rates that have happened the last couple of years, directly responding to Obamacare, talking to one gal in Rio Vista, her quarterly uh, insurance rate went from $4,100 to $7,000 in the last two years. If you like that, vote for John Garamendi. If you like the 800,000 jobs that the CBO is projecting that we will lose in direct uh, response to Obamacare, please vote for John Garamendi. One, if you like the 16,000 IRS workers that will be hired to implement Obamacare, right? it is a health care bill, the 16,000 IRS workers that will be hired then please vote for John Kermendi. If you don't like any of that stuff, then I'm asking for your vote. Because I tell you right now, I lived in Texas for the Air Force a while back, and my Senator Phil Graham stood on the Senate floor, and when Hillary Care was on its way through the Senate, he said, over my dead body will this pass. Well, I'm here to tell you, over my dead body will it Obamacare stay. We have to repeal Obamacare. <laughs> we have to to repeal the huge government takeover of our health care system. If our American health care system is the best in the world, it is the most expensive, absolutely, because it is the best, and we have the best accessibility to it. You know, I talk about if I if I wanted to go to the doctor, it was Saturday, Monday, you know, my wonderful wife would get up early, 7 o'clock, 7.30, Monday morning, and I'd have a doctor's appointment by that afternoon. In most countries that have socialized medicine, all countries, I should say, you don't have that same access. Good luck. Two weeks, couple months, years. <laughs> you know, and I, I just have to tell more stories. You gotta, you gotta. I'm just a storyteller as a pilot. You know, at least I'm not using my hands. You know, but um, you were in a fighter pilot. Uh, right. I had. Um, I was getting my top secret clearance renewed, and the investigator was in my office, and she went through her interview, and then at the end of that interview, she goes, "You're running for Congress, right?" I go, "Yep." She goes, well, let me tell you a story. And she had a wonderful accent. And I, I thought it was Australian, but I wasn't sure because I've been to Australia. And it wasn't English, so uh, she's from New Zealand. I'm like, ah, okay, I got it. And she goes, my friend was in her early 40s, diagnosed with cancer. And they have socialized medicine down in New Zealand. Diagnosed with cancer, took, a, took her four months to get the initial uh, doctor's visit to get that diagnosis. In that four month period, her tumor grew to about the size of a football. They removed it. She had stage three cancer. They were treating her. She was responding. Things were looking good. After, and she didn't say how long, but after a certain 
amount of time, she went for her next doctor's appointment, and the doctor said, there is nothing more we are able to do for you, not treat her and get her better. She had run out of whatever designated money or resources, whatever, said, we are no longer treating you. Go home, get your affairs in order. And this gal started to break down and cry about it. Yeah, and they stopped treating her. She went home and eventually died. That is the future of socialized medicine. It's happening today. And we have to learn from those mistakes of other people's. Don't follow their mistakes. Learn from their mistakes. Obamacare is a mistake. There's things we can do, no doubt about it, and we should. And I wouldn't replace Obamacare with things like, let's keep 26-year-old. My 18-year-old back there is going to go to college. I want to keep her on my health care in this economy. You know, how long does it take? You bet. I like that provision. I like the idea of uh, pre-existing conditions. I'm going to use John Garamendi's uh, uh, story here because he just told it at our last forum about a, a couple who had a, a baby that was... Uh, she was pregnant, and they had some sort of known disease already from whatever test they do. And the baby was covered, it was covered, and then as soon as it was born, well, you'll notice how I did talk about the baby in the stomach. Anyways, you can ask me about that later. <laughs> the baby was covered until it was born. And as soon as it was born, it had a pre-existing condition and no longer covered. That we have to get rid of. Okay? Another one. Uh, if you get sick, in your and you have coverage, you can't be dropped. And another story about uh, a couple, both making about ninety thousand a year, so you had one hundred eighty grand. They had a premature uh, child, and um, the so that it was a very expensive. Insurance company dropped them, <coughs> and now they went bankrupt. Can you imagine making one hundred eighty grand a year and having to go bankrupt? No, that's wrong. But that's going to cost money. Insurance will go up to cover that. So how do we reduce the cost of insurance? How do we reduce the cost of health care? Here's some more examples for you. Okay, tort reform. Geez, why wasn't that in Obamacare? How many votes would that have gotten if you would have just had tort reform in there? Talking to several doctors, about one of the pilots that flies for me, her husband's a doctor, and I sit down and have lunch with him on occasion, but I've talked to other doctors. Half the treatment, that, or half the tests and treatment they do for you is to satisfy lawyers and malpractice lawsuits instead of to treat you. They know you don't have the problem, but they got to test you anyways just to make sure they're covered. A lot of money wasted there. Tort reform so doctors can pay attention to you and not the lawyers. Next, cross-state line insurance competition. Scott Walker, and this is a little bit different, but Scott Walker, governor of Wisconsin, vilified, right? He's suffering a recall election on June 5th because he fought with the unions in Wisconsin, public sector unions, right? About taking, trying to take some of their union know, rights or whatever away. Just vilified. I mean, it, it was very uh, disappointing to me. I mean, I kind of looked at Greece and all the riots in France and the riots. You know, there was riots in France that actually killed people when they were trying to raise the retirement age for firemen from 60 to 62. Yeah. People died in riots because of that. And I thought, you know, that's where America's going if we don't solve some problems. Well, then all of a sudden I see the riots in Madison, my home state, Wisconsin, because of this fight. And I'm like, it's already here. So anyways, Scott Walker wins. And uh, I believe Scott Walker will win his, his uh, recall election for this simple reason. Because what he did worked. Getting back to healthcare now. <laughs> the unions had a lock on the healthcare insurance provided to the public sector unions. There was no competition. So the cost was extremely high. That lock was broken with what Scott Walker did. And now they went to different insurance companies, same kind of service, but much cheaper. And all the red ink in those, uh, especially teachers, in those teachers' unions, all the red ink in, uh, in their budgets have now become surpluses. They didn't fire one person. They have the same health care. They're just saving a whole lot more money. What a trash here. It, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. My mom, who lives in Wisconsin still, and it's funny because I talk to my mom every once in a while, and uh, she's politically involved. I love her. Um, 
And uh, anyways, I could ask me later, it's funny. But anyways, she's talking about Scott Walker when it's going through this. I didn't vote for Scott Walker so he could do this kind of stuff. Rah, rah, rah. She's all against Scott Walker, right, when it's going through. I go, Mom, just give him a chance, you know, see what's going on. And now and on, I'm voting against him. Huh? She's going to flush it, right? Well, I just talked to her a couple days ago. I'm voting for Scott Walker. You know, what he did was great. It was wonderful. So, you know, I think he's going to win. And I'm using my mom as the barometer. <laughs> so, anyways, so cross state line competition. And again, John Gurman, in one of our debates, said, oh, be careful about that. You know, they're going to scam you. People from across state lines are going to scam you. You're going to get this insurance. It's going to be cheap. But then you're going to need it. And it's not going to be there for you. Well, how many, uh, I, I'm a USA member for my car insurance. They're in Texas. One of the best car insurance companies in this in the country. Uh, there's no problem there. Uh, how about Geico? Little Lizard, right? Or Gecko, or whatever you want to call it. I haven't seen them taking a court or a suit or going out of business because they offer you some scammed insurance, right? So the car insurance is a great example of how it's done right. Healthcare insurance can follow suit. Competition is a wonderful driver of, uh, of lowering prices. There are many other ways. Standard operating procedures, something we do in the flying world. I fly with a different pilot at United just about every time I go to work. Uh, but we know what we're going to be doing. You know, the standard operating procedures. We fly and, yeah, okay, that's what he's supposed to do. Yeah, that's what he's supposed to do. You can do something similar in medicine to where you come in with a set of symptoms and, uh, yeah, this is what we normally do. This is cost effective and healing effective. And this is what we do. Some hospitals, it's 50000 for a liver transplant. Some are 250. Same results, same quality. Why is it different? Standard operating. Another standard, why do uh, uh, I go in to Kaiser emergency room with a broken leg? Let's hope not. Now let's say uh, I go in and my insurance company pays a certain amount. Let's say a thousand bucks. Let's say uh, Sarah goes in, not insured. Let's just say she's not insured. And uh, she gets a bill for 10,000 bucks. Why? Why is there different prices for different people? Another standard thing we can do to lower the cost. And now all of a sudden, health insurance is much more available. It's uh, much easier for your employer to buy it for you, to be a part of your package. It's much easier for you to buy it as a self-employed uh, person. Much easier if you're transitioning between jobs to keep. There's ways to make it cheaper. And I'm just giving you some specific solutions. Why or why was that not in Obamacare? I don't know, but as we repeal Obamacare, we can replace it and make it much better. All right, last thing, and I won't dwell on this one too much unless you have questions, but California has a water supply crisis. And we have sat on our hands for over 30 years and not fixed it because of environmental concerns, because of afraid to lose your elections. You know, whether it's the peripheral canal in the early 80s that got blasted uh, in the voting booth, or the environmentals taking it to court to shut down the dams in Auburn. Um, we have sat on our hands and this crisis has just grown. Well, it's time to get off our hands, make a decision, do some stuff, and get it fixed. Because I tell you what, if we let this sit for my son Luke to fix, like my father did for me, and I'm throwing my dad out of the bus, he had nothing to do with it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> my father's generation left it for me. If I leave it for my son, it, it's too late. It's way beyond repair. So how do we fix this? More supply. We just need more supply. We need enough supply for drinking water, for taking care of our citizens. That's a basic commodity. Our government needs to make sure that happens. The Delta needs to be saved. It needs to be uh, a, a uh, protected environment. There needs to be enough fresh water flowing down to make sure the salt water doesn't come up and turn that thing into a salt water marsh. All the farmland, all the, the species, all, everything involved there needs to be protected. We can't throw the Delta under the bus like we did to the farmers in the Central Valley a couple years ago. We also need enough water for our agricultural industry, not only for California, not only for America, but for the world. We must have enough supply for all three items. And the way we do that is we increase storage, recycle, and some desalinization. Increasing storage, a good study just came out talking about increasing our, uh, our building more onto the Shasta Dam, about 18 feet. 
nearly double the capacity, let's do it. It'll cost some money, but it's worth it. Good use of your tax dollars. How about let's finish the Auburn Dam? Whole lot of water we could save there or, or put up behind there. How about the Sykes Dam? I don't know if that's, a, I've heard that many times, I've got to research that some more, but I think that's another area we could build a dam. Oh, and by the way, don't tear another dam down, please. Do not tear another dam down. And let's make a federal moratorium about it. Uh, recycling, something. How much water do you put on your yard? Well, I like a green lawn. I'm watering my lawn. How much water goes into industry? My favorite is a car wash. Well, how much water? Does that really need to be pristine drinking water? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I fly around the world, and I'm in some hotels. I'm in the bathroom about to brush my teeth, and it says right above the, the faucet, <laughs> non potable water. <laughs> if you brush your teeth with non potable water, I survived. I don't know. But anyways, I don't want to go that far. But how about the spigot outside your house? Does that need to be potable water? We could get about 40% extra supply if we take our uh, wastewater, recycle it, not at a pristine state, much cheaper, and run it through our spigots just to water our lawns or to industry to, to do that. So great ways. And then the desalinization <coughs> for some of the bigger cities like LA, San Diego, San Francisco, for water, uh, drinking water. That's down the line, but that's another way we can take some of the burden off our natural water coming through uh, the melt and the glaciers and stuff like that that comes down through the rivers, American rivers, <coughs> and, river. and we can make that happen. But we got to fix it. We have to have a leader, leaders, <coughs> I should say, and I'll be one of them, that says, let's do it. Let's get off our hands. Let's pick something and go forward. And those are some good ideas that I'd like to see in the solution going forward. All right. Purpose. Why to vote for me? Okay? Uh, next one. <coughs> Let's talk about the district. Hopefully right now you're going, hey, that guy sounds good. If not, if you think I'm sounding bad, grab a cookie, grab a truffle. They're delicious, by the way. And, uh, and God bless you, have one of them. But if you like what you're hearing, if you're thinking maybe this is the guy that would be good to represent me in Washington, let me now give you some hope on making that happen. I ran against George Miller in 2010 in a very Democratic district. Very difficult. Oh. This new district was three to one. Three Democrats to one Republican in that district, 59% to 20. We did very good, but we didn't win. That's why I'm here, uh, and that's why I'm still flying airplanes. We didn't win. <laughs> this new district, and here it is, and there's some maps in the back if you want to take them. But I lived down here in Vacaville. Goes over a little bit where John Gearbeny lives here in Walnut Grove. It's kind of like they cut him in and cut me in. I don't know. Or maybe Miller had me cut out. <laughs> but anyways, we're right, both of us just inside the lines. It comes up, uh, and back in the Fairfield Sassoon area is the majority of the district in both. 126,000 voters down, down there. That's the big anchor to the district when it comes to voters. Up here is Yolo, about 80,000, and that's uh, a little Democratic. We've got Davis down there. That's going to be tough, but we'll work it. I got some friends in Davis. Then we come up to Yuba County, Sutter, where we're at today. A lot of good Republicans up here. A lot of good conservative voters up here. Calusa, Glenn, and Lake. The more red it is, the more they vote Republican. The registration is 42% Democrat, 33% Republican. Remember my last race was 59-20, yes? Just to let you know, you, she left right after you said that, but she wanted to let you know that she could always stay till three. Oh, yeah. And um, and you definitely have her vote. All right. <laughs> so, that's one. Just, that's she bad timing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She actually did take food and she has her vote. That's what okay. she wasn't leaving because she didn't like what she did. No. Yeah. She yeah. took food, but you have her vote, is Thanks. what she said. Thanks. Sorry, uh, I thought I'd fill that in. So, anyway, so that's our, our district makeup. It's only a nine point difference. So, it is truly a toss up. Okay, we'll go ahead. It's a toss-up district. It could go either way, and, and both parties know it. There will be a lot of attention where we're at right now. And here's some of the things that happened in 2010 to, to prove that it's a toss-up. Carla Fiorina beat Barbara Boxer, if you just had this district, added it up by one point. She won here. Now, uh, Meg Whitman lost. Same voters. <laughs> Voted for Carly, didn't vote for Meg. Uh, coming down here, uh, the California Republican Assembly candidates add them all up from this area, 
and they beat their Democratic opponents by six points. And then last, I'll just take a look at the congressional candidates, which I was one of, the Republicans, 45.5% to the Democrats, which Garamendi was one of, they uh, had 47. So Republicans lost by a point and a half. About 3,000 votes. Can we make that up? You betcha. Can? Yeah, you betcha we can. <laughs> but let me tell you how we're going to do it. All right, Luke. My wife and I and my three kids, I called us the five snowflake snowball that were up on top of the hill last time, and we started rolling down. Gathering momentum, gathering speed and size. We grew our campaign by the end of November of over 800 volunteers. People raised their hands and said they want to help. Had 1,000 donors. Uh, raised more money than the last five campaigns combined against George Miller. We had a lot of momentum, a lot of steam going. Uh, we did lose. I mean, it was, like I said, it was very difficult. We were the t uh, number five out of 53 congressional races. No incumbent lost, by the way, in 2010 on the con congressional side. Nobody lost. We were the fifth best out of 53 races in terms of improving from 08 to 10. So we did a, little, a lot of good. 59,000 registered Republicans. I received 57,000 votes when about 40-some percent came out. So a lot of those votes came from the kind of states and Democrats. How did we reach across the aisle? Uh, just another caveat in there. Back in Bill, about 96,000 people. In 2008, Miller won handily in back row 54 to 40. I wasn't running back then. He won by 5,000 votes. In 2010, with our campaign, very similar to this one, but this one's doing better. We beat George Miller in Vacaville. Oh, by the way, Vacaville has a 42% Democrat registration to 34% Republican registration, almost exactly the same as the whole district. We beat George Miller 57 to 43% or by 4,000 votes. We swung 9,000 votes in that one town, and that's the only overlap from my old district to our new one. When you talk about we only got to win 3,000 more votes, we can do it. We can do it. Si se puede. I'll just go over my, a little bit more about me so you know. Uh, like I said, I've been married 23 years as of 28 May. Okay. Now everybody knows. My three kids, we've had uh, one born in Texas and two born right there at the Grant Medical Center in, in Vacaville. I'm a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force, currently the commander of my unit, reserve unit, C-17 is down at Travis. It's the best job I've ever had. And I spent nine years of active duty, the rest in the reserves, uh, 16 of it at Travis. We've been at Travis or Vacaville since 1995. I've been to both Iraq and Afghanistan plenty, more than uh, I ever wanted to be, but I'm proud to serve and did a lot of good down there. I've been in charge of several multi-million dollar military budgets one of which was at uh, Pacific Command Headquarters out in Hawaii, where it was a grossly overspent, out of control budget that they said at the time, Major Tubbs, why don't you take this over and try to save this colonel from going to jail? I did. So he didn't go to jail, we fixed the budget, balanced it, moved <laughs> forward, stretched our dollars, prioritized our spending, and said no to the rest. Hmm, what a concept. And right now, as a commander, I have a nearly $20 million budget on our red belt, and I did the exact same thing. Prioritize, stretch, say no, and it's balanced every year to the payment. Uh, and then I've been a United Airlines pilot, flying out of San Francisco since then. Uh, I've got a BA in math from Fresno State University, and I love numbers, numbers love me. And one of the reasons why I feel very good about working on budgets. I've done a lot of uh, Air Force schools, really cool kind of things, strategic thinking, all about war, trying to you know, kill people and break things, that's what we do in the Air Force, anyways. Uh, but also, how to develop policy, how to develop strategies, how to have a consistent worldview when you're trying to make decisions. My wife and I had a small business for a while, uh, just before the war broke out, and property management development, so we've learned a lot about how to do that stuff. Now, hopefully the most endearing thing to you about me today will be that I've never held elected office before. <laughs> Not part of that problem. But I did run to <laughs> All right, and then we'll just finish up here, and then I'll open up the questions. Now, in any successful campaign, it takes three things. It takes a candidate that's worthwhile, 
And hopefully, hopefully I prove that to you today. It takes a volunteer base, which we have an incredible volunteer base, and I'm asking you to join if you like what you're hearing. Because your time is more precious to me than anything else, walking out there, uh, delivering flyers like some of you got on your doors, making phone calls, talking to people, letting them know what's going on. Third uh, is money. And if you are blessed enough to have some extra money that you would like to throw our way, it does take money to run campaigns. And before you leave today, if you could throw a check at my daughter there, she'll catch it. <laughs> and uh, that would definitely help if you can before you leave today. That would be wonderful. Uh, go ahead. And for those of you that are in the upper class, 25 hour bucks is the most you can give me. One person. If you're married, you can write two checks. Brand new And uh, today, how you can help. We're going to start with questions. Ask me questions. And then, like I said, vote for us June 5th. Please help, volunteer. We've got plenty to do. <coughs> Try to check if you can. And then I'll say, lastly, but probably, not probably, it is the most important thing. If you could pray for us, that would be great. It's a lot of work for our family. And uh, all the prayers we can get, we can use. So with that, all of our other questions. Yes, sir. And uh, last time you talked, we had the debate over in Marysville at the American Legion, and we, you talked on the uh, uh, guest worker program. Yeah. Somebody brought it up, about, and you made a comment about you were in a country that uh, I don't remember whether you said it was Qatar or whether it was Kuwait or one, a country of 800,000 people, and yet they had 2 million guest workers and right. it worked just fine. Why couldn't we do something like that? And that's it. That, I've been thinking about that as you, as you said that. Yeah, if you've got a guest worker or work, make your money and leave. Why not? Yeah, and this is an excellent question. And it's one of the ways I think we need to fix our country. And I think big. I don't want to just tickle around the edges on some of these problems. Tickling around the edges is just going to kick the can down the road further. Let's talk about immigration and let's fix it. Win-win for everybody. We have an immigration policy today where you have 12 million, plus or minus, illegal immigrants in this country. That's a huge number. You have an immigration policy in this country today where you have states like Arizona and Alabama that are passing laws to protect their state from illegal immigration, and you have the federal government taking them to court to stop them. But the federal government's not doing their job that the state's trying to do. That's, that's not right. You have a country, or an immigration policy in this country, where you have something called a sanctuary city, where cities, mayors, municipalities, are actually thumbing their nose at the law and not following it. Our immigration policy is broke, flat broke. And I have talked to whether it's farmers, service industry, oh, let's talk about doctors and engineers too. It's not just about the, the ag migrant worker. It's about all kinds of places. There is a place in our economy for what I call a guest worker. And America, America benefits from that workforce. No doubt about it. And I do believe we need to have an immigration policy that allows for that, that welcomes it, encourages it. Now, uh, with that though, there's got to there's got to be some rules. There's, we've got to do this that makes sense. Some want to just enforce the laws that are there. Or even march them all across the river at the end of the bayonet. It's not going to work. And if it was just enforcing the laws we had, why aren't we doing it? We're not doing it. It's not working. Others say, open up the border, let them all in, amnesty, let's let them be citizens. No big deal. Let's, let's make it happen. Not right. Not going to happen. We've got to pick something that works. And again, my solutions, what I want to do for government is I want conservative or common sense, common sense solutions. That means they work today and they work tomorrow. Conservative, which means less government, smaller government, not bigger government. Don't look to the government as the first uh, priority on how to solve things. I want to look at the citizen, not the American citizen, entrepreneur, worker, as the primary source of solutions, not the government. Conservative, smaller, and constitutional. We've had a constitution in this country for well over 200 years that has worked very well, made us the best country in the world, in all of history. Why would we turn our back on such a great document that has set us on this, this path? 
So conservative common sense, constitutional. So looking at that, let's look at an immigration policy that allows for a guest worker program, allow these people in that are looking for a better life, that fit into our economy and provide us a workforce that we need. A guest worker program that's unlimited. Oh, it is limited. But how is it limited? It's limited by the economy. Because if you come here as a guest worker and you get a job and you take care of yourself, great. You get a guest worker ID, you can get a guest worker driver's license, you can get guest worker insurance, you can live in the light as a legal human being participating and contributing to America and living in this wonderful country. However, what limits the amount, because if you open up your doors like that, in this country we have a very safe, if you will, or very, um, uh, we take care of our people. So you do not allow the guest worker the ability to access the taxpayer funded safety net. They do not get welfare. They don't get social security, disability, unemployment. If you are here working, taking care of yourself, your family, great, you're welcome. But we're not going to ask the taxpayer to fund you if you're here. Okay? So the economy will limit the amount of guest workers in our country. Second, now you want to really secure the border. Because if all the good guys and gals are coming through the turnstile getting their guest worker ID because we're not limiting them, the only bad people, or the only people crossing the border, border illegally are the bad ones, the criminals, the drug runners, the terrorists. So really secure the border now. And not just the southern border, but anywhere else that they're coming in, the shores or north, we've got to secure it. And then the third part is we have this 14th Amendment that allows, that has been interpreted, let me say, that if you're born here, that you're automatically a U.S. citizen. Well, the 14th Amendment was in relation to slavery and making sure the slaves were citizens. It was never intended that a French couple here on holiday, and she's six months pregnant and delivers here prematurely, it was never intended for that French child to be American, let alone an illegal immigrant to have a child here on the compassion of our country because we allow anybody into the emergency room and we make sure we take care of them. It was never intended for that to be an American citizen, that child to be an American citizen either. We have to close it. The 14th Amendment says all individuals under the jurisdiction of the United States will be a citizen of my birth here. Guest workers, foreign nationals, non-US citizens, I would interpret as not under their jurisdiction. So they should not be, that it's a wrong interpretation in my opinion. So in this immigration policy, as it's very liberal in terms of letting people come in, it's very fair to the American taxpayer in terms of uh, not letting people in and then letting them just live off of taxpayers, which we don't want to do, and uh, very secure and taking care of our country. We also have to close that loophole in the Constitution that you have to have at least one U.S. citizen, a uh, parent, to be a U.S. citizen. And I don't care where you're born. If you're born in Germany, you're born in Australia, if uh, your dad or mom's a U.S. citizen, you have a U.S. citizenship. And where you're born doesn't matter. So that is my immigration policy. It's win, win. There are some limitations. There are some follow the rules. But America wins with the workers coming in. The economy regulates how many are here. Now you go back and forth. I mean, one of the things that happened, now Ronald Reagan's a, a hero of mine. He really is. One of the things he did was after the Bracero program was uh, no longer passed in Congress, they still let people go back and forth. It really wasn't enforced. In the early 80s, Ronald Reagan shut the border. And now if you were illegal, you were stuck inside here. It created really uh, a culture of illegal immigration. They couldn't go back and forth. This now opens up the border for legal people, guest workers, to go back and forth, visit home, come up here for seasonal work, however they want to live their life and win-win. Uh, but it's not going to be uh, at the cost of the taxpayer, it's going to be a uh, benefit to you. Oh, and by the way, while you're here making a life in America, earning a living, you can get in line and get your citizenship the normal way that everybody else does which now allows your children to do that too, and this whole DREAM Act thing that people talk about, it's a, a conversation. You're here legally, 
your kids, if they're not U.S. citizens yet, can become U.S. citizens and now be a part of an in-state tuition uh, program. But I do not want to see tax dollars, again, go to non-U.S. citizens in this case. So scholarships will be available, all that kind of stuff. It solves all of that problem and takes away the illegality of this issue, lets these people live in the light. I'm going on and on because there's a lot of questions. And I, I, I'm answering all the questions I've had the last time I've done. I'm also trying to answer one. But uh, I really think it's something that'll work, and it, it, it's it, it's win-win for everybody, something we can get behind and solve this problem once and for all so uh, we can get beyond it and, uh, and, and not have a problem. Russ, you had a question. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to approach this this way. You're not a congressman from my district, okay? What do you do about sanctuary cities? Yeah, you know, first of all, if my idea for immigration policy goes through, there's no reason to have sanctuary cities. If a state decides to give your state dollars to uh, uh, non-U.S. citizens, I'm not so sure the federal government has anything to say about that. That's a, a state government issue. Right? Agreed. So uh, I want to see that immigration policy. I don't want to have that fight because we've tried to have that fight and we lose. I want to have the fight of fixing the problem overall. Now, an easy answer to your question is you cut the city off from federal funds until they're compliant. Right? But I'm now I'm busy over here trying to have that fight and use a political capital in, in Congress when I really want to be fighting over here to pass this comprehensive immigration policy that solves it all. I can agree with your, your premise on the immigration policy. Yeah. But currently, realistically, the way things are right now, it's like the budget, you know? Too many people in, in Congress believe that Congress budget should be a baseline budget instead of a zero base budget. That the same sort of thing. Right, right, yeah, and I believe in zero-based budget. Uh,